Hello, my name is Olo and I'm back to talk more Rise and keep piling more useful information on you. This time we're talking all about the much more involved and rewarding endemic life found in Rise with its many unique and often pretty incredible effects. Naturally, we don't know what endemic life we might find out there in the currently known second and third maps of the Flooded Forest and the Frost Islands, but we can obviously talk about the Shrine Ruins. And actually, there is a huge amount of endemic life to be found in just this region. If you didn't know, you can check out where they all are just by opening opening up your map. By pressing R and L to swap between the filters and then revealing those perma buffers known as the spirit birds or any other endemic life of its many forms. But I'll point out where everything is for you. Let's start with the spirit birds though which function uniquely in relevance to your new equipment piece, the petalace. By simply running near any spirit bird, you'll gain a buff to your hunter depending on which bird you grab. There's four forms of these, green for health, yellow for stamina, red for attack and orange for defense. These various buffs will have various levels of power and duration depending entirely on what petalace you currently have equipped. As it stands in the demo, we were given a preset loadout of equipment to match each weapon type, and unfortunately we aren't actually able to inspect the details of our equipment because apparently they're on to us. So for now, what we do know about the petalace is that it's made from a strange plant called Descending Sprig, and we equip it just like any other armor piece. Essentially, we collect pollen from these spirit birds and attach it to the petalace, which then envelops the hunter in the aura, which grants these boosts. We will reset our petalace to zero at the end end of a quest so yeah whatever you get in one hunt won't carry over to a future hunt. In terms of the petalace itself we know that there's actually different types of it. Ones that will raise our attack by greater amounts or even raise our maximum health even more. So the idea is to use a petalace depending on what you want or need. There's actually a lesser talked about fifth version of the spurry bug however so I really should mention that before we move on. The golden spurry bug, the strange one, is the ones that you're picking up all over the map especially in that secret tunnel in the middle of the map where you get loads of them. They reward plus 10 points points for each pickup, and the lore explains that the petalace is what's attracting them. A die made from this bug is apparently a famous speciality in Kimura Village, so perhaps we need to gather these in exchange for colours to then apply to our equipment. Time will tell, when the game releases we'll find out, I'm just speculating, but that's what it sounds like. So that's the spirit birds and the petalace out of the way, now let's talk about the endemic life that we'll use like active items. By finding endemic life and then storing it in our helper cage, we're able to hold up to five of these creatures at any one time, and while in our cage, we're able to find them in our item bar, like say a health potion or a null berry, and then deploy them like it's an item. If you do reach that cap of five, you can easily pull up the helper cage window and then just release a creature to make room for another. Now that's out of the way, what endemic life is actually out there and how does it work? Some of these are pretty neat and useful, some of these are uh, insane. And I actually wonder if we'll see any rebalancing after this demo ends because of it. The creatures we find out there will be on a reasonable respawner, something like five minutes or so, so we can return to an original spawn location to grab another during a hunt if we want it. Let's start with the Stink Mink, one of the early reveal creatures for Rise. This fluffy fellow can be found in many places around the Shrine Ruins, found on the pathways up high and down low, but I will show you them on the map here. These are white skunks meant to lure monsters. The animation when you use them is great, you essentially lose control of the mink and it covers you in its aura before escaping. From here, while you've got that stink mink aura, monsters nearby will be attracted to you and chase after you, which is ideal if you want to lure monsters near one another for say turf wars or maybe to get a wyvern ride. Certainly a nice utility to have if for some reason you don't like the area you're fighting in or you obviously want to bait a monster into another. Comparable to that is the whale nard. This is a rarer one though. This pheasant type can only be found at the top left of area 3 with only one one spawn location on the map. Similar to a stink mink, it will function to lure a monster to you, but in this case with a much greater range and effect. It'll attract one large monster straight to wherever you place it anywhere on the map. Once again, you could use this to draw monsters together for combat, or a wyvern ride, or maybe even a pre-set up trap. Now the lurers are out the way, let's talk about, perhaps, the one you should care about most, the Puppet Spider. Found at the left of Area 5, up on a high path at the side of this hill, this is a yellow spider type, and another rare creature as there only seems to be one spawn. This is the one that will be shown to you in the wyvern ride tutorial. You deploy this spider to fire a single shot of silk at a medium to close range. From 
whatever direction the hunter was currently facing when placed. This shot, if correctly aimed, will instantly trigger a wyvern ride and therefore is extremely powerful as a tool. So it's no wonder that there's only one of these on the map. Because it instantly triggers a mount, I strongly recommend you start any hunt by going and grabbing the puppet spider and then either using it immediately to attack your target monster with say a mounted monster or save it for during the hunt for similar purposes. A word of warning however, you only get one shot with the spider so you need to make sure you don't miss. Other creatures and terrain will block the shot like say this small Izuchi did to save the great Izuchi from the silt. Try to shoot these off only when you're certain of a hit. You can easily put it down right next to a monster if that makes it easier for you. Moving on though, next let's talk about the Antidobra. Incredibly named, this cobra functions as an antidote. You may have guessed that from the name. Found in three places on the map, this will appear as a green snake. Simply put, it will cure poison effects while also preventing future poisons for a period too. So if you're ever hunting a poison monster, that will clearly be very useful. But at the moment in this demo, only Rathian is one to worry about in that regard. Next, we have the Brew Hare, found to the left of Area 12, up on the path along the long hill at the top of the map. It's a small pink rabbit type, which also has a single spawn. Uniquely, this isn't a direct use creature, but more of a passive buff to some items, improving their effects. Whenever you do use an item that is then improved by the hair, you'll get a pop-up on the right of your screen to let you know. The most obvious example is where it increases the healing of a health potion, which is still very nice. Unfortunately, it's still a limited effect, only working around four times, depending on what you are enhancing. But now it's time to talk about maybe my favorite, Eskergo. Eskergo is a very cute and friendly snail, and you'll see these fellows as green snails on the map. Found in three locations all over the place, with one being very near to the camp. By placing the snail on the ground, it will generate a healing cloud that lasts a respectable amount of time that will heal up hunters over time while standing in the cloud. The cloud lasts somewhere around a full minute, which is great bonus healing or even group healing. The next creature, the trap bugs, are a little less impactful, but still useful. Found in three places on the lower half of the region, you'll see these are sort of green L shapes on the map. Functioning like caltrops, you drop them in a small circle around you, and then you want to bait monsters into them. It's useful for a quick stagger, providing you with a moment to either recover some health or dish out some nice damage while that monster is recovering briefly. So if you have a long wind-up attack, or maybe you're organizing a coordinated blow, this could be pretty useful in those scenarios. For the last set of creatures, we have two arch types that come with different versions. Firstly, let's talk about the toads. Currently, there is only two types of toads in the Shrine Ruins. We have the Poison Toad, which is a purple toad on the map, found between Area 6 and 13 along that long river. And when placed, it will generate a cloud of purple, which causes poison damage. Meanwhile, the other toad, the Blast Toad, is an orange toad found on the map, found on the hill between Area 9 and 11. When placed, a cloud of orange will spring up, which can then be attacked to trigger an explosion for blast damage. Meanwhile, the other multiple version creature is much more important, the beetles. The beetles found in the Shrine Ruins do come in four different types. As Rage has made a video about recently, the effects of these various beetles when used on monsters can be incredible. This is due to their unique effects that you can only trigger otherwise by riding monsters and using their attacks on other monsters. Essentially, these dung beetles have elemental dung that we throw at monsters for those effects. Firstly, the fire beetle will be an orange dung beetle on the map, found between area 2 and 4 on that hill. And when you throw this, it'll cause a fire explosion and trigger fire blight. Basically, this is damage over time and even causes a flinch. A nice powerful punch. Next, the snow beetle is a white dung beetle found on your map between the area of 1 and 3. This will trigger snow blight, which will actually slow the monster's movement and attacks. This could be really useful against an agile monster, but is undeniably great against every monster because it just gives you an easier time. Third up though, we have the Thunder Beetle, which will be a yellow dung beetle on your map found in Area 9. When thrown at a monster, this will cause Thunder Blight, which causes the monster to be stunned even by non-blunt weapons. Any hit will build up this effect, but it's still best to hit the head to trigger the stun itself and build it up as fast as possible. Lastly though, our fourth beetle is the Mud Beetle, Beetle, which will be a blue dung beetle on your map found in the area 10. When thrown at a monster, this will cause water blight, which will soften the height of a monster, making it take more damage while affected, almost like a tenderize. That is pretty damn good, guys. Another one that's going to be very, very hard to ignore 
definitely recommend you go grab this during any hunt. For more information about this new blight system when used on monsters, go check out the full video from Rage. Now we've talked about the endemic life that can be used like an item, we now need to highlight the very important other types. Firstly, the fly types, which all provide temporary buffs of some kind when used. The drawback is we can only use these at their original location rather than say put them in a cage and use them where we want. Starting with the cloth fly, we can find these in area 1, 3, 4, 8 and 11, so quite a lot. These are white in colour and basically they'll give you a defence buff for a short time when you use them. Meanwhile, the butter flame in areas 4, 5, 6, 2 in 9 and 1 in 12 are lighter red on the map, white and red when you find them in person, but these give you an attack boost for a short time, and there's so many of them, so this is really good to use. Peeper Sex, <laughs> funny name, are found in areas 1, 2, 3, there's even 2 in 7, and another in 12, and these are all yellow in colour, these give you stamina boost for a short time, so if you're someone who's consuming a lot of stamina, maybe you're a Jewel Blades player, these are really good to use. Next though, oh this is a good one, the Cutterfly, which is more of a dragonfly compared to a butterfly, these are only found at the very top of the map in areas 11 and 12. They'll reward affinity, aka higher crit chance for the period that you have the buff. That's really important. Lastly for the fly types is the flash fly. These are bright yellow and appear as multiple small circles together on the map. Found in areas 3, 4, 12 and 13. These are ones we saw plenty in worlds, so as always they work the same. Pop them and they'll blind a monster that's nearby temporarily. Next up though are the crafty creature types, the lizards. These come in three versions, rock, bold it and scale. Very simply, you find them and kick them, poor things, then they'll drop various qualities of ore. Rock being the most common type of these lizards, boulder being rarer, and scale being the rarest. Not the most useful thing to know in the demo since we don't actually need materials, but good to know in prep for the full release. You can see them on the map like in area 1, or this one high up in area 6. So another common one we'll see around the map are vigor wasps, those big juicy green wasps that when hit or touched will burst into hell for the hunter. Always super useful to save on a potion whenever they're around, and can be found in areas 1, 2, 6, and there's 2 in 10, and finally another in 13. Now lastly we have the wire bugs. These are the creatures we use for silk bind attacks and of course wire bug movement. If you somehow aren't aware, you can actually increase the cap of these by finding them in the world and picking them up. However, they only temporarily stay with you and can add to your max wire bug count to a total of 5. Certainly nice to grab during a hunt, but I wouldn't overly worry about getting to 5 before beginning your hunt, since they do run out reasonably quick. Still, definitely something worth grabbing during a fight or while moving to another. These are all displayed on the map as green, well, wire bugs, and they're all over the place. You can find them in almost every area. What's much more interesting in comparison is obviously the great wire bugs and the jewel lilies that can contain them. It seems that we bring some great wire bugs with us on hunts, but we can also find them out there in the world. Great wire bugs provide a massive wire bug leap compared to the regular version, and they're therefore very useful for moving around the map. They are set on preset paths, however, so it's not like we can use them at will wherever we want. Their locations are displayed by these white markers, which point the direction of the use. Good to know about, certainly good to use. But in conclusion, wow, the endemic life system is way more involved and way more relevant to core gameplay. The utility and benefits for some of these creatures are, you know, nice, while others are just unignorably ridiculous like those beetles. Yeah, they're very important to take advantage of, but they're also not stopping you from hunting normally, which is maybe the best way to include something new like this. Frankly, I really like it. Like I said, my favourite creature is probably Eskergo, just because I find the snail very cute. Let me know what your favourite is. Either way, I've been Hollow, you've been you, and I'll see you next time.